Sci-fi movies are fun, but they have a tendency to ignore reality for the sake of a good story. Here's what movies get wrong about space, and TV shows too. Why not? Let the buzz killing commence. How do you know you're going really, really fast in space? If you're in a major sci-fi franchise, it's when the stars get all streaky. We've all seen it when the Millennium Falcon jumps to hyperspace or the Enterprise goes into warp speed. Only, assuming humans figure out how to exceed light speed, or at least get really close to it, the reality of what you'd see out the window is a lot different. According to NASA, the physics of general relativity mean that, as you accelerate, everything in front of you would appear to clump together, and the effects of the Doppler shift would change how light reaches you. Stuff in front would take on a blue hue while everything behind turns red. Meanwhile, the blue side of things would appear to speed up, while the reddish world would look as if it were moving increasingly slowly. At that point, things would be getting weird, right? Yes! But if you were to pick up even more speed, things would become increasingly monochromatic. If your ship were able to get fairly close to light speed, you'd see the light from stars eventually fade into blankness as it slides out of the visible spectrum until everything would pretty much look like this. Nothing. Bummer. Among the many perils faced by Sandra Bullock's character in Gravity is the prospect of switching orbits. Yes, yeah, she's already dealt with deadly space debris, a lack of communication, and the ever-looming threat of her own death in the cold and lonely reaches just beyond her home planet. But those orbits are tricky, like really tricky. At one point, she has to make it from the incredibly damaged space shuttle to a nearby Chinese space station, which happens to be in a different orbital plane and altitude. Gravity makes it seem like it's a relatively straightforward, if perilous, hop from one to another. In reality, it takes not just a good understanding of the physics involved, but a fair amount of propulsion to get it done. NASA planetary scientist Rick Elphick even went so far as to tell Time that, given the limitations of the spacesuit involved, that part of it is not only far-fetched, but I would venture to say is impossible. Most acknowledge that the most efficient way to switch between orbits on the same plane is something known as the Hohmann transfer. However, that requires at least two bursts of propulsion and doesn't account for the more complicated matter of switching planes, much less in a teeny tiny spacesuit greening around amidst wreckage and space debris. In action-filled space movies, it's almost a guarantee that eventually you'll have a big explosive battle with spaceships blowing up left and right. You usually get some big old fireballs, which really helps sell the idea to audiences that all those exploding things are really exploding. There's just one small problem. Objects that get blown up in space wouldn't really look or sound anything like that. To be clear, things can explode in space. They would still release the same amount of energy, and shrapnel would be, if anything, a bigger danger since it wouldn't have air friction to eventually stop it. What they don't do, though, is turn into gigantic fireballs like, say, an exploding car would. In the vacuum of space, such a flaming spectacle would need either oxygen or an additional oxidizing substance. And then there's the noise it would make. Listen to this. That's fun, but again, wrong. Anyone who was raised on a diet of Star Trek or Star Wars probably sees ships firing lasers and immediately imagines the pachoo pachoo noise that comes with them. On the other hand, there's that ominous tagline of 1979's Alien. In space, no one can hear you scream. The reality is a bit less simple than either scenario, but Alien gets it pretty close. Obviously, there's no air in the vacuum of space. That's a problem if you want to hear things, because sound is only possible when there's a proper medium for sound waves to vibrate through. So when Interstellar suddenly gets silent when Matt Damon blows up, it's on the right track. That said, there are gas clouds in space, and sound can travel through them. But since they're not as dense as the gases in Earth's atmosphere, human ears aren't designed to hear the sounds that travel through them. You need a microphone designed for such a purpose to pick them up. Long story short, Alien got it right. If by no one, it meant no human without the proper technology anyway. We probably have Han Solo to thank for this one. The idea that a spaceship pilot would have to pull off a Hail Mary every time they come close to an asteroid belt is a bit misleading. Look out! According to Cornell Astronomy, asteroids and other rock formations in space are spread out widely enough that the possibility of a spacecraft colliding with them is extremely small. So small that it's probably harder to hit an asteroid than miss it. As David Morrison of the NASA Ames Research Center explained to Scientific American, an average one-kilometer asteroid suffers one collision every few billion years, or maybe one or two collisions over the lifetime of the solar system. That said, it doesn't take a massive collision to cause problems. Sand-sized micrometeorites and cosmic radiation often hit spacecraft holes, which can result in anything from minor damage to technical glitches. 
When Total Recall showed audiences what happens to someone out on a planet without much of an atmosphere, the results weren't encouraging. But while an unprotected human would certainly have an unpleasant experience in space, it probably wouldn't unfold that way. But what would happen? Would you explode? Instantly freeze to death? Actually, I've changed my... The cold is a problem, sure, assuming you live long enough for it to matter, and you wouldn't explode. As Dr. Christopher S. Baird of West Texas A&M University put it, even though outer space represents a lack of air pressure, which usually counters the internal pressure in our bodies, our tissue is strong enough to handle the imbalance. The two things that are most likely to kill an unprotected person in outer space are lack of oxygen and sudden decompression, which is one of the worst ways to die for a human being. In the vacuum of space, the air in a person's lungs would expand rapidly, which could result in lung rupture, blood vessel blockage, and death. That's why astronauts are trained to exhale immediately if anything ever goes wrong. So if you ever see that happen in a movie, it's a little more accurate. Even still, experiments have shown that in a vacuum, a person can only survive for about a minute tops. It's a familiar scenario to anyone who's ever seen a sci-fi film. The pilot of one spaceship light years away, instantly communicating with home base or another spaceship. I have raised Ceres on Zeta frequency. Mathazar, it might be We meet again, Commander. Hello, Ceres. How you doing? Unfortunately, due to the limitations of pesky physics, a scenario like that wouldn't pan out in real life. According to NASA, there's a universal speed limit to communications, the speed of light. And while that distance doesn't significantly affect transmissions between Earth and nearby spacecraft, it becomes a problem as the distance between two communicating bodies increases. A conversation between a person on Earth and a person on Mars would be very stilted due to the sheer distance between them, and replies would take from 4 to 24 minutes, depending on how close or how far the planets are at a given point in time. Or just look at the Voyager spacecraft, which as of May 2025 was approximately 15.4 billion miles away from Earth. In 2015, messages from the spacecraft actually took 18 hours to reach the planet. A quick hello to the nearest star system to Earth, Alpha Centauri? You'll have to wait about a half a decade for the message to reach them. Admittedly, part of the reason why people pay to see space epics in cinemas is to watch a cool cosmic dogfight playing out exactly like World War II aerial combat. In real life, though, space skirmishes would be far less exciting and would be more about careful, precise strikes than typical warplane tactics. One 2020 paper described space warfare as being deliberate and slow. For starters, because of physics, the vastness of space, and the fact that spacecraft have to follow specific paths for travel, attacks would be generally predictable, and shooting opponents would require complex calculations. Weapons. Slot a pair of photon torpedoes in the tubes and compute a firing solution targeting the neck of that Klingon ship. And if you're down on Earth, it would be even more boring. You probably wouldn't see a single thing unless the ship happens to break up and re-enter the atmosphere. Say you're an astronaut in a science fiction movie and you come across sudden danger. Like maybe an alien suddenly crawled out of a spaceship vent. You likely want to get into your spacesuit, and fast. However, the tricky thing about actual spacesuits is that they take a while to get on. For one, the current style of suits used by NASA and other space agencies isn't just one suit you can pop into. They have multiple layers meant to supply oxygen, keep you from overheating, allow for clear communications, and ensure you have a day's supply of water. The whole affair can weigh over 90 pounds, though at least weight isn't such a concern in the microgravity of orbit. The bulk of these suits, however, will definitely slow you down. Then there's the matter of safety. Retired NASA astronaut Nicole Stott told Wired that part of the suiting up process involves glove checks, in which astronauts will examine each other for spacesuit flaws. You wouldn't want your spacewalk partner to rush through that process. In The Martian, astronauts are faced with massive destructive dust storms on the surface of Mars. Matt Damon's character is pretty much blown away when a dish comes careening into him from the intense winds of the storm and is accidentally left behind by his fellow crew members. But the truth about storms on Mars is much more complex, even if it won't literally bowl you over. First, Mars has a very thin atmosphere. This means that the weather it does manage to experience is typically generated by heat from the sun. If this very regular pattern of solar heating targets an area with a lot of dust, this could spell a dust storm on what's already a seriously arid planet. Very occasionally, these storms grow large enough to encompass nearly the entire planet. That's obviously not a good thing in movies or real life. Particularly fine or widely distributed dust has interfered with rovers. You don't respond especially well to solar panels caked with the stuff. This dust can also become electrostatically charged and wreak havoc on electronics. But can it knock you over? 
Probably not. Astronauts would have a heck of a time with charged fine dust particles getting into their suit and disrupting equipment, but they would probably remain standing. While Martian winds can reach 60 miles per hour, remember that the planet has a seriously thin atmosphere, which significantly reduces atmospheric pressure and the power of those winds. From a certain point of view, the massive helmets on film spacesuits make sense. If you're paying to watch actors in a movie, then wouldn't you want to see them? So we get expansive helmets that allow actors to emote from all angles, often complete with inward-facing lights to illuminate their faces better. Common sense dictates that lights facing up into an astronaut's eyes are a no-go, but what about the size? Dr. Kathleen Lewis told GQ that those extra-big movie helmets are kind of absurd. By contrast, she held up a close-fitting Apollo-era helmet that was so cozy astronauts had to get used to wearing it before launch. One of the tests of pilots and astronauts is seeing if they can put the helmet on and not feel claustrophobic. Modern helmets are a bit bulkier, in part because they have to contain so much stuff, but there's still little reason to make them overly large. The broad plastic of the helmet allows for a fairly wide field of view, enhanced by a gold-coated movable section that acts as some of the strongest sunglasses you've ever seen. Even so, they aren't quite the monstrous helmet specimens you'll see in some sci-fi movies. Have you ever thought it's odd how so many movie aliens and planets kind of look the same? Maybe they get a coat of body paint or some tentacles here and there, but all the people parts are usually still there. Even if the aliens are more like animals, they're still usually just different versions of Earth animals. Cross my heart, smack me dead, stick a lobster on my head. But it stands the reason that life on other planets would almost certainly evolve in wildly different ways than it did on Earth. Different atmospheric elements and gas concentrations could all have profound effects on the way a life form looks. Who says they even have to be carbon-based? We obviously have no idea what aliens would actually look like, but just as one factor, gravity differences alone can have dramatic effects on life. Even in the shorter term, astronauts who spend extended periods of time in almost zero gravity experience changes in eye shape, reduced immune function, lowered blood pressure, and muscle wasting. And someone who weighs about 110 pounds on Earth will be roughly 42 pounds on much smaller Mars. Someone growing up on Mars might be relatively taller or less muscular. Though, given enough time, successive generations of Mars colonists might have larger, more robust bones to deal with the bone density damaging low gravity of the planet. Given this and other forces like cosmic radiation, different weather patterns, different atmospheres, and more, people could change drastically. When you hear about the bends, you may first think of the perils of saturation diving or deep sea expeditions. You put the thing in your mouth and breathe, how hard could it be? Well, if you come up too fast, nitrogen gets into your blood and you get the bends. Also known as decompression sickness, the bends happen because nitrogen that gets dissolved into their blood during the dive needs time to disperse. Zoom up too fast and it instead forms large and painful bubbles in one's body tissue. Astronauts have to consider this issue too, even though movies show them flitting in and out of pressurized airlocks whenever the story calls for it. But nitrogen can cause serious issues, only in reverse. Spacesuits are less pressurized than a spacecraft or space station. So before astronauts step out of their craft, they do something called pre-breathing. Essentially, they sit for about two hours breathing pure oxygen to expunge nitrogen. Astronauts can move around during pre-breathing to speed up the process somewhat, but there's no getting around the fact that it's an involved process. What's more, the procedure of getting in and out of airlocks requires other time-consuming steps that are vital to ensure everyone's safety. They sure aren't hustling through it all, they know it's good for them. If you know anything about faster-than-light travel, then you know that as the physics currently stand, it appears impossible for just about anything to exceed the speed of light. There might be exceptions on the quantum level, but us macro-level creatures will currently have to temper our expectations. So what about black holes we could use as wormholes? Could they represent a cosmic shortcut that gets us from one black hole to another outlet somewhere else in the universe? Is it really as simple as folding a sheet of paper and stabbing it with a pencil? It folds space so that point A and point B coexist in the same space and time. So you can take a shortcut through a higher dimension. Yeah, you go first. If you're going the route of hoping a black hole will take you to another place or dimension, the tricky thing about flinging yourself into a black hole is that, beyond the event horizon, nothing gets out, including attempts at communication or the light that could show your progress. Physicists also think that the force inside a black hole is so powerful that it will cartoonishly pull you apart in a process called spaghettification. Then again, it's possible that a supermassive black hole is large enough that a teeny human might be able to escape that particular fate, though they'll still have to deal with the black hole's cosmic radiation. We're also not sure that a wormhole would remain stable. Perhaps the massive forces that form one would slam shut while you were mid-journey. Then what? Well, we'd rather not find out. Good to see you in one piece, Doctor. 
Oh, am I? I feel like my innards have been to a barn day. Star Trek makes it seem like it's no problem to stand on a transporter pad, allow yourself to be disassembled, shot through space, and then reassembled on another pad far away. Except for that one transporter accident in the first movie, and the other whoopsie in Star Trek The Next Generation that created Will Riker's grumpy twin, Tom. Beyond that, transporters in Star Trek and other space-themed media almost seem boring. As you might guess, getting a real-life transporter working is far trickier. Currently, it appears that molecules and even atoms are a bit too large to be teleportation candidates. Scientists have observed quantum teleportation, in which subatomic particles can pop out of you in one spot and back into existence in another. This often destroys the original, but still represents an exciting frontier in computer science and communications and it's hardly sending a whole Captain Picard down to a planet's surface. What's more, the sort of quantum entanglement necessary for all this teleportation business is notoriously finicky. Just one tiny component out of place, like a pesky molecule bonking into another, can cause the whole setup to decohere. What would that look like? Hard to say. Maybe like this. <laughs> God forbid you get a fly in your teleportation pod. Looking at the highly controlled conditions even quantum-level experiments need, the teleporting you see in movies is chaotic in comparison. It's better just to take the shuttle. Danger. The emergency destruct system is now activated. Obviously, a self-destruct button is a great way to ratchet up the tension in your movie. In the final act of Alien, Ripley activates the vessel's self-destruct function, which includes blaring klaxons and a countdown that contributes to the panic of her escape. Plus, there's a pretty good explosion at the end of it all. But if a xenomorph managed to make its way onto a space shuttle, would astronauts have a similar choice? Beyond the broader dissimilarities, we're not exactly at the stage in our space exploration where we're sending gritty mining crews into deep space. The existence of a self-destruct function in modern spaceships is tricky. Unless NASA is keeping it from us, there's no button you can smash to trigger a space shuttle to explode, which makes sense. That said, there are fail-safes under the control of ranged safety officers, should something go awry mid-launch. This includes an abort function that would destroy the vehicle and its associated components should it threaten people on the planet below. So, in a way, maybe there really are self-destruct buttons. Rare is a space movie that mentions one of the greatest perils of space radiation. Before you get too worried about astronauts up in orbit, they're probably fine. Yes, they do have freaky stories about seeing bright flashes and streaks of light while trying to sleep. These are actually errant cosmic rays zipping through their skulls. Yet current evidence indicates that most astronauts don't have a majorly elevated cancer risk once back home. Deep space is another story. Ionizing radiation, a sort that can cause significant cell damage and leads to elevated cancer risks, is all over the place once you get out of low Earth orbit, and it isn't always easy to block. Plus, there's the fact that astronauts on these sorts of missions will be out there for years at a time, greatly increasing their radiation exposure. It's enough of a potential issue that scientists planning a trip to Mars have focused on the problem, especially after the Curiosity Mars rover determined that during its trip to the Red Planet, astronauts would be getting radiation doses that would significantly increase their risk of developing a deadly cancer. Congratulations on 182 days of smooth sailing. And welcome to Mars. To find out more, the Artemis 1 launch in November 2022 sent two mannequins specifically to measure the unique effects radiation may have on female astronauts and potential ways to best shield their tissue from damage. 